persecution against believers. And uh, from Open Doors Ministry, uh, Brother Andrew's uh, ministry that he founded, they have a list of uh, the top, I think it was 50 uh, countries that are um, where Christians are persecuted. The, the worst persecution is in North Korea. And uh, it's a population of 25 million people, 300,000 Christians. Um, much of that um, uh, persecution comes from the government. Um, it's a single-party dictatorship, and uh, the main religions there are atheism and traditional beliefs, um, but there is um, huge oppression against the church. And so we want to, there's a flyer in your bulletins that gives you some information about that. And I want to challenge you uh, to be praying for the believers in North Korea. We are one church. And uh, whether you are a believer in the United States or in Korea or in some other country, we are all part of the same body. And so uh, we want to be uh, lifting those up before uh, for the Lord in prayer, not just this morning, um, but uh, throughout the week as well. You will be remembering your brothers and sisters in North Korea. Ron, come and lead us in prayer, please. Call the ushers forward and also. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the freedoms that we, we enjoy here in the United States. Lord, I ask that you be with those people that are in, in North Korea, that um, you would be with them as they worship you and watch over them. And Lord, I ask that you help us to remember them this week and pray for them in, in their situations. And now I ask, Lord, that you would um, bless the offering that we are going to receive and help us as a board to use those gifts wisely. Put them in the places that they need to go. Lord, I just ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number 128, Wonderful Words of Life. And if you can, please stand. Wonderful words of love. 
scripture. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we'll be reading verses uh, 1 through 12. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in the tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless, one, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers... If I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what, what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with ourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? for you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world and none without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Let's take time for prayer. Um, you may be seated. And again, I've been asking you to pray for unbelievers in the community. I would again challenge you this morning to just take a few moments as we pray to lift those names before God. Our Father God, we pray that you would, as we lift these names before you, send your Holy Spirit into the lives of these people to draw them to faith in Christ to open their eyes to the truth of Christ and their need for you and to make them devoted followers of Jesus. And Father, we pray as a church that you would continue to guide and grow us, that you would guide us to the right pastor for this community and for this congregation, that you would lead him to us, that you would put that together in your time. And Father, we pray that as we come to your word, you would challenge us, stretch us, encourage us, and equip us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Diokete tain agapen zeluta de ta pneumatica malan de hina profe tuta. Te tu, I don't even know how that's pronounced. Do you agree? I remember preaching at a church in Poland one time, 
And afterwards, I was standing there, and my, <clears throat> my translator was standing next to me. And this, this guy from the church came up, and he handed me something, and he said something in Polish. And he turned to the translator to translate it for him, and the translator turned to me and said, uh, I'm not going to translate that. That's not from the Lord. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, um, it, it's, it's, it's okay. You can tell me what he said. He's like, no, no, that's not from the Lord. I'm not going to translate that. I said, no, no, it's really okay. Well, the, the, the upshot of it was that he had felt I was trying to ignore something or avoid something, and he hoped that my time in Poland, I would come to understand the importance of whatever it was I was avoiding. I never was quite clear on what I was avoiding. Um, but that's what happens with language when we don't understand. What I just said actually is the Greek version of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, but you didn't understand it, and it therefore had absolutely no value to you whatsoever. The verse says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. When, when we come to this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Apostle Paul has been talking about the superiority of love over spiritual gifts. The, the, the real test of spirituality is not having some kind of deep spiritual experience. The real test of spirituality is not speaking in tongues or, or some other supernatural experience. The real test of spirituality and spiritual maturity, Paul said, is love. Now he switches his focus slightly as we come to this chapter. And one of the questions we need to ask is, what does love look like? Well, we read 1 Corinthians 13, love is, you know. But really he's going on with that whole thing in this chapter because what love looks like is that love is about building up one another rather than seeking my building up or seeking my experience or seeking my feelings. Love looks like ministry that is others-focused, not self-focused. And that brings us to the issue of communicating in an understandable way. Charles Spurgeon, the, the famous Baptist preacher in London from the uh, 1800s, said, I am determined as far as I can to preach the gospel plainly and simply so that everybody can understand it. That's what... Paul's saying in this chapter, intelligibility or communicating God's word in an understanding way is more important than giftedness or spiritual experiences. Come to the first five verses here. He says in verses 1 and 2, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy, because one who speaks in a tongue or a language speaks not to men but to God, because nobody understands him. But he utters mysteries in the spirit. There's no value in that to the body. It may be a wonderful experience, and it may make you feel close to God, and it may make you feel spiritual in some way, but it doesn't do anything for anybody else. It's like me standing up here quoting verses in Greek for you or any other of a hundred languages that you don't understand. It does us no good. But he said prophecy has a different role and prophecy, again, is, is a spiritual gift in this context. It's about speaking forth God's truth to people, but it's speaking in their own language. So he says in verse 3, on the other hand, the one, so this is a contrast between tongues and prophecy. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Three things that ought to be happening when we come together as a body. One of those is upbuilding. Way too often, 
when the body comes together, there are some people that leave feeling not upbuilt, but cut down or rejected or unimportant or hurt in some way. But when we come together, we're supposed to be coming together to build one another up and to encourage one another. Let's, let's be honest. Life takes courage. It's much easier to just hide away in my house and just divorce myself from the world. But it's not healthy. It's not healthy for me. It's not healthy for you. Because God made us a body and we, we really need each other. So one of the things that's supposed to be doing is that we're not just building each other up, but encouraging each other that we're there for you and we're there with you and we're walking through this with you. And we can give one another the courage to keep going, to hang in there. And consoling. There's a lot of pain in this world. And it's fascinating. I, you can sit down with almost any five people and you start telling a story about some deep pain in your life, and all five people have stories of pain. Because we have all experienced pain. I have a friend right now in Texas. She's about the, she's about the same age as my son. She, uh, she was born with a disease that causes tumors in her body inside and outside. And leaves her in a lot of pain. She was um, born to a single mom who couldn't raise her. Her grandparents ended up um, adopting her. She's been in two marriages, both abusive. She has a son who's a teenager, and he's a special needs young man. And both of her parents just passed away. And she needs somebody to just care for her. That's what we're supposed to be as the church. Because the reality is that that's not my story, that's not your story, but we all have stories like that. We all have pain. And the body is supposed to come together, not to, not to avoid each other and have a spiritual experience that makes me feel close to God, but to come together to build up and to encourage and to console one another. Verses 4 and 5. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues. It's a great thing. Wonderful experience. But even more, I want you to prophesy, he says, because the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless somebody's there to interpret it. It, it, it. Unless there's somebody there that knows that language, it can tell you what he's saying. It has no value. Because the goal, end of verse 5, is so that the church will be built up. Let me, let me read you the beginning of a news story from the BBC. It was published in March uh, 26th of 2016. That's how the story starts. Two homes in the United States, uh, state of Texas, were torn down accidentally when the demolition company apparently followed GPS to the wrong address. How did that happen? Lindsay Diaz was stuck in traffic on her way home from work when she got a phone call from her neighbor. I was hoping it was some kind of sick joke, she told BBC. My neighbor said someone had demolished my house. My daughter had been yelling at them, but sure enough, when I arrived, it was gone. Now that's pretty shocking, but let's be honest. Church is about building up, not tearing down. And way too often, tearing down is what happens. That's why he said in the last chapter, the greatest is love. 
Because when we come together, the purpose of the church, you know, we can argue about whether tongues are active today or not active, active today, or whether the sign gifts are active today or not active today. That's not the point. The point is that when we come together as a church, our purpose is to build up. Not to come for me. Your presence here is an encouragement to others around you. Church is not for me, it's for others. We come to verses 6 through 19. We have an illustration of why intelligibility is so important. Verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues... How will I benefit you? Uh, Unless I give you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. There's there's no benefit there. I remember when I was living in Houston, I had a side job working um, for a company where we we serviced um, these crane machines. You know, the ones where you put your quarter in or 50 cents or whatever it is, and the, the crane tries to pick something up and you never get anything out of that? Yeah, I was servicing those. By the way, some people can work them. I don't know. There's, um, and I got to a theater, and I, I, I walked in. The door was open. I walked in, the, the, and I hollered because I don't want to just start messing with the machines uh, until somebody knows I'm there. And one guy comes around the corner, and I said, Hi, is there anybody else here? And he's like, No inglés. And I said, um, You, me, anybody else here? And he's like, No inglés. And I said, well, I'll, I'll come back. Started to leave. He goes, he goes, mi amigo, Inglés. And he's like, okay. And he was going to call a friend on the phone that spoke English so that we could communicate. But you see, he understood, as did I, the necessity of communication. We needed somebody to translate so that we could communicate. Way too often... We come to church and we're more concerned about experiencing God than about building one another up by communicating truth to one another in love. He says, even if lifeless instruments like a flute or a harp don't give distinct notes, how can anybody know what's played? If a bugle gives an indistinct sound, who's going to get ready for battle? I, you know, little kids love to play piano, right? But they're not playing any song. They're just making noise. And some, I, I, it's cute. I had a granddaughter that would sit at the piano and would say, you know, one thing at a time. So she, one finger, she's not banging. She's just playing one. She's still not playing anything. Because it's not distinct. There's, there's sp- certain notes that has to be, have to be played in certain order for certain amounts of time in order to actually make music. Bugles have a specific sound that they have to blow, a specific a, a series of sounds that, to, 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 to indicate to the troops what's supposed to happen, retreat or, 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 or attack or whatever they're supposed to be doing. I remember finding my uncle's cornet Apparently, he played the cornet in high school, hadn't, hadn't used it in years, and as a little kid, I discovered it, and I just thought, oh, this is so cool. I picked it up, blew through it, and nothing happened. Couldn't figure out how that works. Finally, I figured out, oh, you got to pierce your lips, and you got to kind of, I don't know. I, I learned how to make noise. That's as much as, that's as far as it went, noise. It never was a clear note. Never figured that out. But we made noise. But you see, that's not really what musical instruments are for. They're for actually playing music. And the church is not for us coming together and having separate individual experiences that make each of us feel good. It's about the body of Christ coming together. And so he says, speech needs to be intelligible. So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, How can anybody know what you're saying? We have to be communicating to one another. By the way, 
This isn't just about the gift of tongues or somebody speaking in a language they haven't learned. This can even be about speaking the same language on a different level. I mean, if I come in and, and preach all of my sermons on uh, the level of some of the doctoral books that I read, uh, none of us are going to be built up. You know, it, it's my job to understand at least some of the $50 words, but my, my job is also to communicate the concepts of $50 words and $5 words that we all understand. And that's what Spurgeon, I, had, I ran across another great quote by Spurgeon, but then I, when I wanted to use it, I couldn't find it. Um, but basically, that's what he's saying, that some of these young preachers like to stand up and use all these $50 and $100 words that make everybody impressed with all of their learning, but nobody understands what they're saying. I remember him quoting a prayer, and it had some line like, uh, the, the words in, in the prayer were something about ineffable tincture of something. And it's like, anybody know what that means? I, not a clue. Speech has to be intelligible. Verse 10, there are doubtless many different languages in the world, and, and none of those are without meaning, but if I don't know the meaning, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. And so with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive for something that will build up the church. I remember our first trip to uh, Eastern Europe. We were in Timisoara, Romania, and uh, the first time that I uh, tried to order something for myself, we went into a McDonald's. And I, I didn't realize that, at least in that country, one of, the, nest, one of the, the requirements for having a job in McDonald's is that you can speak English, because that's where all the Americans go. And so I walked up to the counter and I was going to try and figure out how to order something and I said to the lady taking my order do you speak English and she rolled her eyes at me and was like yes like of course a little irritated by contrast I went across the street from where we were staying to this little shop to buy some water so that I could go back and make coffee and because he didn't speak English and I didn't speak Romanian, I came home with water to make coffee that was carbonated. By the way, you can make coffee with carbonated water. Did you know that? Um, <clears throat> Communication is important. Understanding each other is important. He says in, in, in the, the next section, in verses 13 to 19, and we won't take time to look at all of those verses, but let me just read them really quickly to you. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue uh, should pray that he may interpret, because if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing also with my mind. Otherwise, if you give thanks in your spirit, how can anybody in the position of an outsider, that is somebody that doesn't know the language that you're praying in, how can they say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct other people than 10,000 words in another tongue. By the way, that's 2,000 words to one. One word that you understand, he says, is more valuable than 2,000 words that give you an experience but don't build anybody up. So verses 20 to 25.
Brothers, don't be children in how you think. Be infants, innocent in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it's written, it's talking about the Old Testament, by people of strange tongues and by lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people even then. They will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Well, prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and they all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers come in, won't they say, you're out of your minds? You guys are nuts. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider uh, comes in, he's convicted by all. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God really is among you. First of all, in verse 20, we are called to be mature believers. Maturity has to do not with experiencing spiritual gifts, but growing in the fruits of the Spirit. Secondly, he quotes a passage from Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, talking about tongues. Now, the context of that, if you go back to Isaiah, is this. He says, as an act of judgment against Israel, he's going to take them off into a foreign land where they're going to hear people speaking in languages they don't understand. And when they hear people speaking in these languages they don't understand, they should recognize that that's a sign that they have missed God's purpose in their life. It's interesting that throughout the book of Acts, wherever you see tongues being practiced in a public setting, there are always Jews there. And that should have been a sign to those Jewish individuals that they had missed their Messiah. They had missed the purpose of God. Now, the the, the passage says, but they're not going to listen to me anyway, which is sad, which is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost when everybody stood up and all of the believers, 120 believers, they're all speaking in different languages. By the way, these were real languages that people understood and everybody in the congregation or in the, in the community, as they gather around, they're all hearing different people speaking in their language. And it was a sign to them, it should have been a sign to them, based on Isaiah, that they had missed God's purpose in their life. They'd missed their Messiah. But instead, John says he came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. <clears throat> Dr. Tom Constable, in his notes on 1 Corinthians 14, he says this. He says, Paul permitted only intelligible or understandable utterances when the church gathered for worship because they edify believers and bring the lost to conviction of their need for salvation. As inferior as the gift of tongues was, it did have a legitimate purpose, namely to impress unbelievers, especially Jews, with the gospel. Speaking in tongues was a feature of some of the pagan Greek mystery religions. And so it would not have been as made a, as big an impression on the Greeks as it did on the Jews. Primarily, it was a sign, I believe, to the Jews to point them to Christ. But when not understood, verses 23 to 25 say what it does is brings confusion, not conviction. Now, the point of all of this is simply that we need to be communicating in ways we understand. I remember one of my first trips to Eastern Europe, and we were riding in a car and and driving through these towns, and I'm looking at the traffic signs, and none of them make any sense to me whatsoever. And the driver apparently understood them, and, and he knew when to stop and when to go and when to you know, not go down that road. And, and I'm looking at these signs. They, they don't, I don't get any of them I don't, because they're not our signs, right? They're, they're not speaking my language. They may be pictures and symbols, but they're not speaking my language. I, I had no idea when to stop, whether a street was a one-way street, whether to yield, 
I was clueless. By the way, too many times, somebody comes into church that's never been here before, and they're clueless as to what we're doing. We need to, I, I, I was looking around this morning, I commend you. Um, you've got signs up showing where the sanctuary is and where different things are, and that's really good. A lot of churches don't. I was in one church that you could literally get lost in the building and never find your way out just trying to get to the restroom. They painted colored lines on the floor. Follow that color. It'll get you to the bathroom. And because it was a weird building. But people come in and they don't know where things are. They come in they don't know when they're supposed to stand. When are they supposed to sit? They don't know if they're supposed to be singing. And we need to make sure that we're helping them with these things, not just expecting them to understand. Because when we come together, it needs to be intelligible. Earlier, you didn't understand me when I quoted 1 Corinthians 14 in Greek. Because you didn't understand, it was of no benefit to you. Only when it was tra translated into English could you learn from it at all. When it comes to this chapter, the Apostle Paul has been talking about the superiority of love over spiritual gifts. The real test of spirituality is not speaking in tongues, not having a certain spiritual experience, but love. In church, we need to love one another. Intelligible understandable communication of God's word is a key application of love. I quoted Charles Spurgeon earlier when he said, I'm determined as far as I can to preach the gospel plainly and simply so that everybody can understand it. That's, that's what Paul's saying here in, in, in this passage, 1 Corinthians 14. Intelligibility is more important than giftedness. It's more important than spiritual experiences. Now, that's all great, but what does that have to do with us here today? The truth is, many of us come to church to experience something. It might be the worship, it might be the music, it might be the prayer, it might be the peace. We, we want to experience God's presence, and that's not bad. We, we, we want to feel loved and accepted, and that's not bad. We want the music to carry us away into the presence of God, and that's not bad. But the truth is, that's not why we come to church. Or it shouldn't be. We come to build one another up in our faith. We come to encourage one another to continue in our faith. Or we come to come to faith. We come to console those who are hurting and to help them keep their eyes fixed on Jesus in the dark times. Church and ministry is not about having a spiritual experience. It's about building one another up, encouraging one another, consoling one another. In other words, church, it's not about me. It's about those around me. And that changes everything. So, I'd like us to close this morning by turning our hearts toward one another. Now, don't get anxious. I'm not going to ask you to bury your soul to anybody. I'm not going to ask you to speak. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to go hug somebody. I, I, it, it, it's all cool. We're all Scandinavians. We don't do that. 
or at least we were raised Scandinavian culture, in a Scandinavian culture. But what I would like you to do is ask you to take a moment right now, or in a moment here, to pray. Not for yourself. Not even for your family. Pray for those around you, those sitting beside you or in front of you or behind you. Pray for somebody else. Because ministry is not about me experiencing God. It's about building up the body of Christ. So would you take a moment and just between you and God, pray for someone else here. Our Father, forgive us for those times when we decide it's just too hard to go to church. They don't need me there anyway. Forgive us, Father, for the times when we have been more interested in ourselves than in those around us. Forgive us, Father, for being more concerned about what I feel than about the hurts and needs of my brothers and sisters. And so, Father, even as we talk about the need for for your word to be spoken in a way that is understandable, may we be the voice or just the hands of Jesus Christ today to build up your body for your glory. In Jesus' name.